Seth Klarman is one of the best investors in the market today and is estimated to be worth $1.3 billion. Seth has managed to achieve a 20% compounded annual return rate for 30 years. This means that if you invested $10,000 with Seth 30 years ago, you would now have over $2.3 million. Warren Buffett has said there's only a handful of people he believes could reliably beat the market, and Seth Klarman is one of them. However, he's not a very vocal person, and he doesn't share his opinions or views on the markets or investing very often. So when he decided to go on CNBC recently, it was kind of a big deal, and he shared some incredible insights. In today's video, we are going to discuss his interview and the key takeaways that you can use to improve your own investing. With that said, let's hop right into the first clip. What changed so drastically that you felt needed to be adjust, ad addressed over the last 15 years? Yeah. The first thing is we've been in an everything bubble, I think, that um, a lot of money has flowed into virtually everything. Um, historically low interest rates, even zero rates have um, precipitated that bubble. Um, you've also had a lot of changes in the business world. Technology has um, accelerated, if anything, and you've seen disruption of all kinds of businesses, which creates challenges and opportunities for investors. Um, so that's another thing. Um, some asset classes have become increasingly popular. Private credit has um, had, a, had a day in the sun. You've had um, uh, speculation during that bubble in all kinds of things, from crypto to meme stocks to SPACs, in, in a way that I think, and the book has some important reminders for people about the, the dangers of speculation and the importance of remembering what kind of environment you're in. In this first clip, Seth is saying that he believes the market went through an everything bubble due to low interest rates and how cheap money was. When interest rates are low, it causes the value of everything to become inflated and very skewed. The reason is because people can access money at a much cheaper cost, which also means they can afford to spend more money. For example, a $400,000 mortgage with a 1% interest rate would cost roughly $1,500 per month. However, that same $400,000 mortgage at the current 6.5% interest rate would cost roughly $2,700 per month. This shows that when interest rates are low, the same $400,000 home becomes much more affordable which also increases the price that people can pay for homes. This is the exact same story for stocks and all other assets. From 2008 to 2021, interest rates were just above 0%, which meant that borrowing money was essentially free. What people could do is borrow money at no cost, then throw that money into the stock market to earn higher returns. The difference between the interest rate and the returns on the stocks is the profit for the individual or the business who took on the debt. For example, if you can borrow $10,000 at a 1% interest rate, then it will only cost you $100 per year to sustain that loan. You could then go and invest this $10,000 into a dividend stock that pays you 5% per year and to earn $500 in annual dividends. The $400 difference in the interest on your loan and the dividends is your profit on the debt. So when interest rates get low, people can take on massive amounts of debt and pour that money into all sorts of assets, which massively inflates them. Seth believes this has happened and that basically everything entered a bubble. Legendary investor Howard Marks has also said that when there's too much capital availability, money flows into the wrong places. And Seth believes this is why meme stocks, SPACs, and crypto all went crazy over the past couple of years. But now, let's move on to the next clip, where Seth discusses what he believes a value investor is. You're, you're a value investor. What does that mean, and what did you learn from Grandma Dodd? The academic definition of value is by the stock that's cheapest by the numbers. But I don't think that's what Graham and Dodd wanted. In fact, it's clear that they were talking about earnings power and the growth possibilities in a business, even if they're hard to determine. And so I think value has to be determined for every company. The way I think about the market is not that there are growth stocks and value stocks, but rather that all stocks may hold value. Um, but that all stocks also could potentially be overvalued. So you have to have a mechanism, a rubric for figuring out the value of different kinds of assets, different kinds of businesses, and then figure out which ones are trading particularly mispriced. Seth says he does not believe there is such a thing as value investing. He does not believe that there are value stocks and growth stocks, but that every stock can have value at one price and then become overvalued at another. 
This is a very interesting point that I personally completely agree with. Warren Buffett has also said he believes that what is smart at one price is stupid at another. Therefore, it's not that there's value stocks and growth stocks, but that all stocks can have value at a certain price. A great example of this was with Coca-Cola's stock during the tech bubble of 2000. Near its peak, Coke was selling for a price to earnings ratio of 70, which is an earnings yield of only 1.4%. On top of this, for the year of 2000, Coke grew its revenues by only 5% and its earnings actually declined by 10%. This means that Coke was offering a yield of 1.4% while its sales were growing slightly and its earnings were declining. This is a massive price tag to pay for a slow growing business, especially when you consider how bonds were offering over 6% at the time. However, during the tech bubble of 2000, investors did not seem to care. They continued buying the stock regardless of its expensive price tag because Coke was a dividend paying value stock that was obviously going to grow over the coming decades. So how could investors lose money? Well, because this value business was priced so high that it was no longer offering investors any value at all. Coke's stock price then lost half of its value from its peak in 2000 to the pit that it saw in 2003. Coke stock price also did not make new highs until 2011, 11 years after its peak during the tech bubble. Coke even managed to consistently grow its business over these 11 years. However, the price investors paid for the stock in 2000 was unjustifiably high, which resulted in an 11 year period of no returns. In fact, Coke shares purchased in their peak of 2000 and held to today have only grown at an annual rate of 2%, which is not a good return rate at all. This confirms that just because a stock is seen as a value stock does not mean it is offering you any value and that you can still pay too high of a price for it. Therefore, you should always consider the value of the business you are buying and the amount of cash that business can return to you relative to the price that you are paying for it. What makes this story of Coke even more interesting is that Warren Buffett was one of its largest shareholders in 2000 during the tech bubble. He held the stock through the tech bubble, despite it selling for that price to earnings ratio of 70. However, in the book, The Snowball, it was revealed that Charlie Munger was urging Warren Buffett to sell Coke at its high price, but he could not sell the stock because he was on the company's board of directors. He would have to leave the board to sell his shares, which he was reluctant to do. In hindsight, Buffett does make it seem like he did regret not selling Coke when the stock was incredibly overvalued in the year 2000 though. Buffett also wrote the following in his 2003 letter to Berkshire shareholders. We own pieces of excellent businesses, all of which had good gains in intrinsic value over the last year, but their current prices reflect their excellent. The unpleasant corollary to this conclusion is that I made a big mistake in not selling several of our larger holdings during the great bubble. Buffett admits that he made a big mistake not selling some of Berkshire's positions when they were extremely expensive in the tech bubble. With Coke not producing returns for 11 years after the bubble and only producing a 2% annual return to this day, it is easy to see why Warren Buffett believes he made that mistake. This example shows that a value stock can become overvalued and that no matter which stocks you're looking at, you should always consider the returns the business behind the stock can offer you. The best metrics to focus on to help you answer these questions are the earnings and free cash flow yields of the business. These metrics will tell you how much cash the business behind the stock can produce for you versus the price you're paying, which can help you make sure that you're being sufficiently compensated for the investment, whether it is a value stock or not. Let's now move on to the next clip where Seth discusses what investors need to consider in long-term investment decisions. So I think in a world that's changing as fast as this one, it's really important to think about not just what are the earnings today. The earnings today may not be here tomorrow. They may be disrupted. The business may be gone or they may be 50 or 100 percent more. So I think investors need to take into account what are the longer term prospects for a business. I think investors have become vastly more sophisticated these days than in Graham and Dodd's era in terms of thinking about what causes a business to be resilient to competitive threats. Also, Warren Buffett has showed all of us the value of growth, that he um, thinks hard about some of the highest quality businesses in the world, but only buys them when they're at attractive prices. So I think that's an important element of it as well. Seth tells us that investors should not just be focused on the earnings of the business today because earnings can be disrupted in the future. 
Therefore, buying a stock at a seemingly low price ratio does not mean that it's guaranteed to result in a successful investment. For example, from 2010 to 2022, IBM has traded for an average price to free cash flow of 11.85, which is considered quite low. However, during this time, IBM's share price lost 38% of its value. This means that despite investors paying a low price ratio for their business, they still lost money on the stock for 12 years straight. The reason IBM share price has declined is because the business saw its free cash flow decline consistently over this period, dropping a total of 42%. IBM's business has been increasingly disrupted by large tech giants such as Google and Microsoft, which have eaten in to IBM's profits and lowered them. Stock prices follow the profits the businesses behind them make. If a business's profits are growing, then the stock should follow over the long term. However, if a business's profits are declining, then the stock will follow the profits down. Therefore, what's incredibly important for investors to consider is if a business's profits will grow, decline, or remain the same in the future. It's not just about what price the business is selling for or how much cash it can produce today but also about can those profits be maintained or grow in the future. This is why Warren Buffett focuses so much on a business's moat and long-term durability. He wants to make sure that the businesses he buys will be around for the long-term and will still be producing profits and growing profits for decades to come. Understanding the business's competitive advantage and what makes it able to continue producing profits for its shareholders is incredibly important to the success of an investment. And therefore, a business having a moat provides much more safety to investors than a business without one. However, Seth then tells us that it's not just being able to find businesses with a competitive advantage, but also being able to buy them at the right price. Warren Buffett is known for buying stocks only when he believes they are selling for a cheap price, and therefore, they can offer him high returns. His Apple investment is a perfect example of this. Warren initially purchased his Apple shares in 2016, when the stock was trading for a price to free cash flow of around 9, which is also a free cash flow yield of about 11%. In 2016, Apple was facing a few headwinds that were causing the business's revenue to decline slightly. The market was concerned about the business's profit in the short term, but Buffett was looking at the long-term potential of Apple and how strong its brand was with consumers. He believed Apple was one of the best brands in the world and that the business would continue to grow over the long term. So he purchased one of the highest quality businesses in the world at only a 9 price ratio. Today, Apple trades for a price to free cash flow of 27 and it's almost unimaginable that this business would ever become so cheap again in the future. So not only did Buffett identify one of the best businesses in the world, but he also waited for the perfect time to buy it and then he bought big. Apple now makes up roughly 50% of Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio and is well worth over $100 billion in the portfolio. So finding the right business and then buying it at the right price is absolutely crucial. But now let's hear what Seth has to say about what's gotten more complicated in the markets and how he has adjusted in his own portfolio. What's gotten more complicated with the markets in the 40 plus years that you've been doing this? And by the way, I should say, when I asked Warren Buffett at one point, like people who could beat the market, because he's long talked about indexing, has always thought that indexing is the way to go. He's, there's probably about five people who could actually beat the markets over time. And you're one of the names that he, that he listed on that, um, which is huge praise um, from one of the best investors ever. But what's changed for you over time as the markets have gotten more complicated, as there's been more competition? How, how has your style evolved? I think you have to almost run harder to stay in place, that you have more competitors, smarter competitors, more information is available at everybody's fingertips. Investors need edge to be successful. They need to think about what is it they know or how are they structured that will allow them to outperform, to create alpha for their clients in a way that, that buying the average stock won't do. And so we've become a little bit more focused on private investments. We think there's more inefficiencies in some private markets than public markets. We've become more global over time. When we started, we were a couple of people and $27 million. And today we're, we're almost, you know, at $25, $26 billion. So it's really been an evolution in 260 people. Um, I think that you can continue to find edge, though, um, in how you structure yourself, how you incentivize your team, how you lead your team. Um, you can find opportunities in 
around the edges of what other people are doing, finding situations that other people are throwing out, like the baby with the bathwater. And they exist. It's, you have to be patient. They're not always there. But when they're there, they can be particularly attractive because the markets can become quite frenetic these days. In this clip, Seth says he believes investors should focus on where they have an edge or some sort of additional insight. This is very similar to what Peter Lynch says investors should do, which is to invest in what they know. By investing in what you know, you can potentially have insights that the average person doesn't have, which can give you an edge on a specific stock or a specific industry. Additionally, Seth says investors should look where there are more inefficiencies in any market. Inefficiencies are where things are more likely to become mispriced. And Seth says he's been finding inefficiencies in the private markets, global markets, and ideas that other investors are throwing out. Unfortunately for public investors, the private markets tend to be very challenging to invest in. So that one is kind of off the table. However, we do have access to the global markets, such as Chinese, European, and Indian stocks. China also seems to be a market that investors are currently avoiding or throwing out, which is arguably creating some very attractive valuations in the Chinese stock market. Other sectors that investors seem to be currently throwing away are banks, utilities, and commercial real estate. Investors are worried that rising interest rates will cause the real estate market to crash, which will lead to billions of dollars in losses for banks that hold these mortgages. They're also worried that remote work will continue to cause stress on commercial real estate's profitability. So the rising cost of debt plus the loss of income in office real estate is causing many investors to avoid this sector altogether. However, there are still offices around the world that are in high demand and seeing their fundamentals continue to grow. Brookfield is one of the businesses that is trying to take advantage of this sector by acquiring more office space around the world while prices are currently depressed. Utilities seem to be selling off recently, once again, due to rising interest rates. Utility businesses tend to take on massive amounts of debt to fund their expansions and growth. Therefore, while debt is becoming more expensive, utility businesses could see profits decline or even go negative. Algonquin Power is a renewable energy utility provider based in Canada and has recently seen its share price fall massively due to rising interest rates causing the business to become unprofitable. So it seems like there's fear in the overall utility sector that more businesses could be pushed into unprofitability if interest rates do keep rising. This is causing many investors to ignore the sector altogether, which could arguably be creating some significant discounts on the utility businesses that are high quality. Situations like these do happen, and they can create opportunities for investors. Seth says they do not always exist, but there are times where the sentiment is so negative against a stock, industry, or entire country that it can create some significant discounts and investment opportunities. But that is going to wrap up the video for today, everyone. And I really hope that you enjoyed these insights by Seth Klarman and my analysis of his interview. Also, I wanna let you all know that I have started an intelligent investor series here on my channel, where I am going through the intelligent investor book chapter by chapter, and I'm going to go through the entire book. I created this playlist because the book is very dense, it's very dry, and it's also very hard to understand. So these videos simplify everything you need to know, again, chapter by chapter. So seriously, I would recommend checking it out. It's one of the best playlists and videos that I have ever made on my channel. So seriously, go and check it out. And if you enjoyed this video, then please remember to leave a like on it and subscribe to the channel if you are new here, because that would also be pretty awesome. But with all that being said, thank you all so much for watching. I truly do appreciate it. And I really hope to see you all again in my next video.